Well, uh, welcome to the May 16th meeting of the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission. Please rise and follow me in the Pledge of the Allegiance. I pledge, pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. I'd like to remind everybody, please silence your cell phones, if you would, so it doesn't get too distracting. Uh, we do expect our chair to show up, but traffic being what it is, uh -oh. uh, <laughs> sometimes we don't get here. Anyways, um, Esther, should we call the roll call? Commissioner Lemo? Here. Commissioner Reeder? Here. Vice Chair Gregory? Here. Chair Simpson is expected to come in later. Commissioner Ingler is absent. All right. Then uh, would you like to read the uh, recording uh, for public comments? This is the time and place for public comments. A speaker card is available for those wishing to address the Traffic Commission regarding the items on the agenda or in the subject within the city's jurisdiction. Speakers for specific agenda items shall be called and heard during that specific item. All remarks should be addressed to the Traffic Commission as a whole and all documents for the Commission and the official record should be presented to the Recording Secretary prior to speaking. Speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Under state law, public comment matters may not be considered by the Traffic Commission unless listed on the agenda, but may be referred to the city engineer for administrative follow-up. As comments can only be recorded while speaking into the microphone, please refrain from addressing the commissioners unless you are at the podium. As of this time, no one has submitted a speaker card. Okay, so, um, excuse me all, I didn't know I was chairing tonight, so. Um, I don't see any general public speaker cards, is that correct? All right, then uh, I'm going to delay five with the summary notes since I wasn't here last week and we don't have enough to vote on that. Um, and let's go ahead and skip to engineering report. And uh, staff, would you like to start on 6A? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Finley. Uh, Vice Chair Gregory. Um, Nader Hadari, our project manager, is going to give our first two reports tonight. Uh, they were requested uh, as information items just to give the commission an update on some current projects that are under construction with the city. Thank you, Cliff. Good evening, commissioners. So we have uh, two projects that we're going to be giving an information item update on tonight. And uh, we're going to start with the larger one. And uh, this is the 2018 citywide pavement overlay and slurry program. Basically, the goal of this project, and this is a biannual project the city does, uh, the goal of uh, this project, as with others, is to keep our streets, you know, uh, the best in the best condition uh, in the county, and maintain them in that in that fashion, and preserve our assets. Here's the map of the. Uh, pavement program for this cycle it's a very large one it's 51 miles of streets um, in fact it's what the most uh, expensive one in the city's history because we're doing a lot of the major arterial roads and uh, you can see them on the map but you know if I can list them here for you briefly uh, we have Lynn Road Thousand Oaks Boulevard Herbs Road Olson Hillcrest Rancho Conejo North Moore Park Road Townsgate and Avenida de las Flores, uh, just to name a few. So it's, it's really hitting all regions of the city and um, uh, focusing heavily on these pri uh, primary arterials that are carrying uh, the general public you know, to and from their commuter every day. This was uh, made possible by um, city council's one-time uh, additional fund contribution toward the project as well as the uh, new gas tax funds that the city has been uh, receiving. We'll look at that in, in a moment. So just quickly, uh, here's some of the treatments we're gonna be doing. They're um, some tr tried and true, one, tested ones that we've done in the past. 
slurry seal. This is one that's uh, a thin resurfacing treatment, protects and extends the pavement life five to seven years, primarily used on the uh, residential streets to keep them you know, from um, deteriorating. Then thin maintenance overlay is, is a thicker solution, which has a longer uh, treatment life. It's an inch and a quarter, and this treats streets that are in, uh, you know, um, a little bit worse shape and that need a more beefy solution. And then primarily used on the more arterial roads that get heavier loading is the full overlay, which is two inches thick and will extend the pavement service life by 15 to 20 years. So those are the three treatments, uh, the three primary treatments. We have a couple of um, other areas as well. So here's a couple um, pictures of, um, and I have a few just to share, so uh, of the work taking place, some of the barricade signs that have been going up notifying the uh, community and businesses before the work starts. And then on the right is um, in the background there, uh, we didn't have a zoom in shot, but that's the new um, handicapped curb ramps that we're installing and upgrading as we go. On any of the streets that we're paving, we have to upgrade the uh, corner ramps to meet ADA standards, new federal standards. And um, so that's an ongoing thing that we're doing, and which is included as part of the project. So the schedule, we just started construction a couple of weeks ago. So we're in the second month now here in uh, May. And the project will extend until November. And it's going well so far. Um, on track, uh, the uh, public outreach component um, we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, here's those curb ramps we discussed. Uh, the road repairs are in progress. We're going to be doing the City Hall front parking lot this Friday, um, at, which is a you know, City Hall closed day. And... Um, a few other city facilities around town as well on the certain off days. As I had mentioned, the budget comes from various different sources, but major contributions from this new SB1 state uh, statewide new gas tax, as well as the general fund contribution that the city council made to invest in the pavement. And on the outreach, you know, this has been a key element to making this project be a success. It's a very impactful project when you're touching... 51 miles, which is about one seventh of the whole city. So, you know, um, one out of every seven streets is getting paved. So it's, it's been all encompassing and it's been going on way before we've started construction. Um, and it continues to take place and direct contact with the neighbors as well as through our website and social media. And here's just a few of the, um, the examples of the, uh, that we're deploying. And uh, we can answer any questions that we might have about this particular project. Commissioners, any questions? I'd just like to thank you for all the hard work. And the website's down there, the toaks.org <laughs> slash your streets. Okay, looks good. Thank you. We'll jump thank to you. the uh, second one, project number two here. Another one that we just started construction on a few weeks ago. And that is the Westlake Boulevard Sidewalk Project. And I'll do a plug for the website right now, toxorg slash Westlake. Um, so again, this is also a project that's been um, kind of long in the making in terms of design and the need has been obvious. Um, it's roughly a mile long from essentially the 101 freeway down to Triumphal Canyon Road. There's small components to just north of the freeway, but basically that's the stretch. And, you know, this is a quick graphic of some of the, you know, the obvious need that's there. It's a very heavily used uh, roadway in terms of pedestrian and bike traffic. Uh, maybe one of the highest in the city. And uh, uh, to on top of that, you have high-speed traffic and there's no sidewalk. So you put all those things together and, uh, you know, the, the need of the project is pretty clear. And also, in addition to you know pedestrians, there's also bicycle improvements that are you know, being incorporated into the project, uh, providing a more clear path of travel for the cyclists, striping, uh, a, a new bike box that we're putting in at Triumphal Canyon. Uh, again, very heavily traveled. In fact, I was out there today, and probably a platoon, I think that's the right word, of 50 or 60 bicycles came through right around uh, you know, 10 a.m. So <laughs> heavy usage uh, for, for certain there. And, you know, hopefully uh, the improvements of this project will lessen the risk of, um, you know, conflict with the uh, vehicles. I will note the green bike striping is 
part of the project design, but it will be installed by Caltrans after they complete their overlay of the road, which is going to follow our project. So we didn't want them to grind up, you know, our freshly laid striping and have to put it back. So they've agreed to just install it themselves. So the project will continue in that fashion. Here's a quick um, depiction of how the sidewalk is being placed into the existing landscape slope that's adjacent to the road there. One other feature the project has is the, uh, it, which is depicted in orange on this slide, is a DG decomposed granite jogging slash walking path adjacent to the sidewalk, kind of side by side, where we were able to fit it. We weren't able to put it everywhere because of space limitations, but where it's possible, we've included that, recognizing that there's a high vo volume of traffic there and allowing certain people, you know, who may want to jog and may wish to do it on an alternative surface that might be softer on your knees and provide more space too. So if somebody's on a stroller, you can jog past them on your jogging path. Also, we're including a couple of Vista benches that will help you overlook the Westlake Lake as well um, during your jog if you're fatigued and you'd like to park it there for a minute. So, um, And also, the project is primarily on the east side of the street between Triunfo and Agora Road, and then it switches. The missing sidewalk is actually on the opposite side on the west side of the street where the commercial district is where Cisco's and Carl's Jr. and those other um, uses are. So it kind of bounces from one side to the other. But when it, the project's complete, there will be a continuous sidewalk on both sides of the street all the way down. Project's a little bit unique because it's, it's a Caltrans right-of-way. It's a Caltrans street. It's a you know, State Route 23. So uh, we're making the improvements. We're making the investments. But they're ultimately the, the owner of the uh, facilities. And um, But without this... Um, you know, movement on our part, you know, it may not, it may never get completed. So that was kind of the impetus. We're also putting some special crossing at the ramps there. So that's kind of a difficult point right now for people, I think, who are trying to walk. You get to the ramp and the cars are going fast. And so there's going to be a flashing beacon there, uh, which is kind of a, a unique tool that, you know, kind of warns the motorists in advance when someone's crossing and provides a little additional safety. So schedule-wise, as I mentioned, the project started last month. Um, here's a couple of photos. This is uh, the existing condition before we started doing anything. Started doing some removals, and you know, pretty soon we're we're opening it up. Another benefit that we're doing is so we're getting rid of a lot of the turf that isn't so desirable anymore, and we're going to restore the landscaping when after the sidewalk is in with more drought tolerant landscaping, and that's been done in conjunction with all the HOAs ba based on plant palette that they like, and as uh, and also works for the city. So here's the opened up excavated uh, section. That's getting ready to be um, formed up and will be start to be poured in the next few weeks of the uh, sidewalk. This is that same depiction originally where the, that couple was jogging and, and so forth. And some more exciting construction photos and um, staff is available if we have any questions about this project. Any questions? Commissioner? Uh, um, just a curiosity about how far Caltrans jurisdiction and areas like that extends for overpasses and ramps. Is there is there a set linear foot distance or? No, there is not a set linear foot distance, but generally they own the ramps and the first signal that the ramps intersect with and then pretty quickly it becomes not their facility anymore just past that first intersection okay so so that's a the common farther down the street uh i mean if if it was 100 feet down the street or something like that 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 would be cities in, an, in a typical situation yeah yeah well i mean th this one's different because the whole well, decker yeah, canyon I, and all I, this I but yeah, yeah but, but that only goes to the 101 really... north of the 101 it's a city facility right so yeah, the question wasn't really pertaining to this one it just came up I'm asking for another reason, <laughs> but yeah. I thought it'd be a good time to ask. So just as for some clarification, it really is delineated by the edge of the intersection. So if you come up in that off, wherever that off ramp or on ramp starts or ends, usually the other side of that intersection, uh, I'll call it the side not against the freeway, is mm -hmm. become city property pretty quickly. Okay. Thank you. And I know this project's been going on because it came 
through us once before. <coughs> really glad to see it coming to fruition. Glad the money's there, everything else. So thank you for the hard work. Thank you. And also, I drive Westlake Boulevard every single day and want to say that we haven't, I personally haven't noticed any traffic or disruptions with all the construction going on and it still looks really nice and it's going to be really really a great project for our community so thank you for all your hard work in collaboration yeah and the collaboration as far as the work hours they've been modified so that they're not hitting that morning peak hour or the the evening peak hour in terms of the, the lane closures and that was done in conjunction with the traffic um, division over here so yeah much appreciated Okay, so now moving on to item 6C. <clears throat> yes, good evening, Chair Simpson. Um, our senior engineer, Jim Mashiko, is going to deliver this report to the commission. Okay, thank you, Cliff. Uh, uh, Chair Simpson and members of the Trap Commission. Um, the item before you tonight is the annual uh, school crossing guard re uh, program review. Crossing guard program is administered by our human resources department. It was uh, transferred uh, uh, up to human resources from public works about four years ago. Assisting me um, off to my left is uh, Elena Keenan. She's from human resources and she oversees the operation of the program. Uh, we'll both be fielding questions after the, this presentation. Uh, just to give a little background, uh, on the crossing guard program, here's a map that shows the 25 crossing guard locations dispersed throughout the city. Uh, they serve uh, 15 elementary and four middle schools. Uh, the purpose of a crossing guard is not to control traffic. Uh, crossing guards do have a number of challenges when they're out in the field, uh, especially with uh, drivers who are distracted or fail to yield the right of way. But they're basically there to determine the appropriate time to enter a crosswalk with their stop sign to uh, uh, ensure traffic yields right away safely to school students. Um, to educate uh, our children or students about our uh, safe crossing habits, and we also like them to be our positive role models to the students. Uh, we Here's a graph that shows our crossing guard uh, locations through the years. This is a 10-year history. About 10 years ago, we had about 37 crossing locations. Uh, the number has declined uh, from down to 29 to the current number of 25 uh, as a result of declining enrollment and other factors. There's about 29 to 30 guards on staff with an annual budget for the program of about $380,000 and each crossing location uh, costs about $15,000. Uh, what does it take to qualify for a school crossing guard? Uh, it's a combination of pedestrian and automobile traffic per location. Uh, the pedestrian volume should be uh, at least 20 students uh, during both the morning and afternoon school peaks, and the automobile volume is either going to be 300 or 500, depending on the type of traffic control established at that intersection. Uh, but both the auto and the pede pedestrian number needs to be satisfied during both uh, morning and afternoon per, uh, peak periods to qualify for crossing guard. Um, every year we um, do evaluate and, and count their uh, autos and peds at each location. And um, in terms of students, only the students that are grades K through 8 are counted. Uh, adults and their toddlers are not counted at the location. The students, when they're crossing, they could either be walking, could be on a scooter or on a skateboard. Uh, they're counted in the um, when we do the observations. Uh, the data shows that two locations no longer meet our standards, and those are uh, Borchard Road at Michael Drive in Newbury Park, and the second location, Gainesboro Road at Windsor Drive in Central Thousand Oaks. Here's a location map of our first location, Borchard and Michael. Uh, it's just south of the 101 freeway. This location serves Earth's Magnet School and Sequoia Middle School. Here's a uh, street view location or view of um, uh, the crossing uh, location. This is looking eastbound for a pedestrian who wants to cross Borchard Road. Uh, as you notice, this intersection does have a traffic signal. Uh, traffic signal does provide the highest level of protection for any pedestrian at, uh, an, at an intersection. 
because you do have the pedestrian push button feature to activate the walk uh, displays for pedestrians. Um, this slide summarizes our uh, pedestrian and vehicle counts. Um, uh, the pedestrian counts are rather low here. We have about two uh, students crossing in the morning and two students crossing in the afternoon. We do have a pretty high vehicle count, but as I said earlier, you do need to have both the pedestrian and vehicle count uh, both exceeding our city standards to, to qualify for a crossing guard. Second location shown here on this location map is at the intersection of Gainesboro Road at Windsor Drive. Uh, this location serves Glenwood Elementary School just to the north. And here's a uh, street view uh, photograph of the uh, crossing location. This is uh, looking westbound on Gainesboro Road, looking up ahead at the crossing location. Uh, this location is equipped with a number of pedestrian enhancements. It includes a uh, curb extensions to allow the pedestrian to stand out a little bit further into uh, to viewing traffic and also allows the autos, uh, the drivers, to see the pedestrian waiting across. We also have push buttons at this location that activate uh, flashing beacons, warning lights uh, in advance, and at the crosswalk. And this slide summarizes our um, uh, pedestrian and, and uh, vehicle counts. Both uh, pedestrians and vehicles no longer meet our uh, city standards. Uh, when we made a recommendation for both Borchard and Michael and Gainsborough Windsor intersections, our data or our decision wasn't based on just this current year worth of pedestrian data. You notice in Table 3 of the staff report, we did show you um, the pedestrian counts for the prior two years. So in the prior two years as well, we did have low pedestrian counts at both locations. We were also asked to take a look at the intersection of Panamint Court at Cascade Avenue uh, adjacent to Westlake Hills Elementary School to determine whether or not that would qualify for a crossing guard. Um, here's a street view level of uh, looking westbound on Cascade, which is stop sign controlled. Panamint Court um, is uncontrolled. And here's our data. It easily qualifies for a crossing guard for pedestrians and um, automobiles during both the morning and afternoon school times. Um, so with that, the recommendation is in the staff report. Uh, the recommendation rec uh, developed by the Traffic Commission this evening will be forwarded to the City Council in June. Um, we'll be glad to answer any questions, um, and thank you. Any questions? Um, would you like to address the letters that we received now or wait until after public comment? We'll probably address those after public comment. All right. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Thank you. Commissioner Reeder. Thank you. I just wanted to um, confirm that the state standard is twice what our city standard is. Is that correct? Yes, the uh, so state, state standard in terms of pedestrians is double, uh, requires double the pedestrian count okay. so that the city the does. City of Thousand Oaks is very, very conservative as far as how many crossing guards are in our city. We yes, we that's we correct. We encourage them if they meet our standards. That's correct. It's easier to get a crossing guard in the city of Thousand Oaks compared to um, probably all the other cities in California. Thank you. Commissioner Lemo. I, I have a quick question on your assessment. There are at least five factors that I've made a list of uh, after uh, observing myself and uh, seeing kids go through the system. Do you take any other factors into account uh, besides the uh, number of, of pedestrians and number of vehicle trips? And the reason why I ask that is it seems to me that even still our numbers are conservative. When I look at the factors that have been uh, impacting uh, public schools and their attendance and uh, the changes that they're going through, not the least of which is the changes in the neighborhoods. But I didn't know if you took any of that into account. 
Well, we did take into consideration for these two particular locations, uh, Orchard and Michael. Um, that one has a signal control. So as I mentioned earlier, um, what really helps there is uh, the push button feature to activate the walk uh, display to uh, tell drivers that pedestrians have the right of way at the intersection. That's uh, uh, really took um, uh, was was something that we strongly considered, and also at the intersection of Gainesboro at Windsor, uh, the photograph I showed showed you the features, the safety features for the pedestrians that were added a number of years ago as part of a Safe Routes to School project. So that's that also factored into our decision making process. I appreciate that. I guess to be more specific. Um, when I look at the schools whose enrollments are down, do you consider the fact that that would impact the amount of pedestrian traffic you'd have specifically by students? Um, we we actually um, look at the standard that's been established by the council and try to to follow it as as written. Um, it's It's fairly obvious to us that as we look at the historical counts of pedestrians, and that kind of coincides with the number of students who are there. So that, that may be the why, but in our evaluation, we, we pretty stick pretty closely to what the standard is. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering on the Borchard uh, corner, a um, couple factors. Uh, are we just uh, counting uh, walking pedestrians or does a bicycle rider that gets off, I mean, is he a pedestrian or is he something other than <laughs> not really a vehicle? Yes, we, we basically count anyone that's a student that's uh, grades K through 8. They could be walking or using uh, their skateboard or their bike or uh, their scooter. Um, they're, all, they're all being counted. Right. Uh, Are there any right turn on red conflicts or is does the light... I'm, I'm I'm not familiar with that traffic flow as well as as much as I wish I was but okay yeah in terms of the vehicles that we count we would count any vehicle that would cross the the walking path of that pedestrian through the intersection so that's what the count reflects is any vehicle in conflict with the walking path of a pedestrian through each of these uh locations okay thank you any other questions okay so I want to get a little bit more um, information regarding the data collection because two students seems very low considering there's two schools in service right there. So I maybe missed it in the presentation, but was there something with the weather that day or how many days was the city out evaluating the traffic, uh, foot traffic at that location on Borchard? Um, well, in terms of um, the low pedestrian count at that location, Earth's especially the location at Michael and Borchard. Uh, Earth School, it's not a traditional uh, elementary school that uh, collects students from the local neighborhood. That one is uh, it's a magnet school, so I believe, from my understanding, most of the students that g uh, get there, they're not really walking trips. They're more, more or less driven. And then the other location is Sequoia. That one's ra uh, pretty far away. Um, that one, we have a higher pedestrian count at Borchard at Teresa. So it's, it's probably not going to find a whole lot of kids walking all the way down to Bo uh, Borchard and Michael to cross there. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Lamel. I, I have a comment on that as well. I, um, I am very familiar with that intersection. Um, and if you stop and think about where the homes are and where students would come from, it would be very hard to imagine that many, if any, Borchard students were crossing at Michael. That would mean that they're, you know, either living at the gas station on either side. And the reason I say that is because all of the homes would be on what would be considered the west side of that street, and they would either cross at Teresa or they would stay where they are and go to Sequoia. So it's, it's that, that strikes me as the counts being very accurate. Thank you for that insight. Oh, we have an uh, additional comment by Elena Keenan regarding the weather and other oh. factors when Thank they're you. performing counts. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, commissioners. I was going to say, <coughs> when when the counts, when the traffic counts, okay, 
thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, commissioners. So um, when the traffic counts are conducted, we to ensure a valid count, we conduct those traffic counts on good weather days and not days preceding or immediately following a holiday uh, so that we can ensure the, the best validity with, with the traffic counts that we're doing. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay, so if there's no further questions for the staff, uh, we can proceed to comments on item 6C. <coughs> so at this time, our first speaker is uh, Kimberly Jackson, followed by Nicole Johnson, and followed by Barbara Sponsler. Kimberly, go on up to the microphone, thanks. Thank you. Start here. Mic's on. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Kimberly Jackson. I am a resident of Westlake Village. I am a parent at Westlake Hills Elementary, and I am also a resident of Westlake Hills. I am here speaking in uh, regards to the suggested crossing guard at Cascade and Panamint. Um, if any of you are parents, I'm sure many of you are. You have children and you're running around doing extracurricular activities like myself, so I didn't have time to prep something, so I'm shooting from the hip by telling you this. I am very fortunate that I live in the neighborhood and that I get to walk to school every day with my children. I have been a parent at this school for four years, and with my youngest, I still have another five more years to go at this school, so I'll be at this school for nine years. I'm also very fortunate that I do not have to use the intersection uh, in question as far as the crosswalk, but I do have to use the sidewalk portion of it. I can show you numerous photos on my phone. I have close to 100 photos on my phone of cars just in the past 30 days that either park in the crosswalk, park on the red curbs, or park across the sidewalk, which I do have to use. So it requires myself and my children to walk out into the lane of traffic because we cannot even use the crosswalk as there's cars parked in it. I contacted the city of Thousand Oaks Police Department last week asking for some sort of assistance in this um, and they did state that they would send someone out to the school. My concern is that I have watched numerous cars blow through the stop sign that is on Cascade Avenue as um, he mentioned Panamint Avenue is uh, an uncontrolled intersection. It's unfortunate that I have seen numerous near misses, uh, including myself and other students in the neighborhood. I am firmly for and in favor of a crossing guard at this intersection because I have witnessed far too many near misses. And unfortunately, the parent excuse of I was running late or it's my first time, it just doesn't fly anymore. You need to take student safety and quite frankly, adults, pets, even though they're not included in the account, they all have to be kept safe. And if a crossing guard is what it's going to take, then a crossing guard is what we need. Because I don't know if having a police officer stationed at the school all day writing tickets for the amount of traffic violations that I've seen is an option. So I just want to say on behalf of numerous parents and 502 students that are enrolled in this school, and it is continuing to increase in enrollment as it is one of the top three schools in the district, we have numerous people that do come from out of the neighborhood as well. I highly, 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 highly encourage the use of a crossing guard at that intersection. Thank you. Hold tight for just a second. Are there any questions for our speaker? Okay, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Nicole Johnson. If you would please state your name and city of residence for the record, that would be great. Nicole Johnson, resident of Westlake Village. Um, I'm here to talk about the busy intersection of Cascade Avenue and Panamint Court, which is front of, in front of Westlake Hills Elementary. It's a very hectic uh, situation at drop-off and at pickup, and it's very dangerous. Cars come down Cascade, Cascade Avenue at high rates of speed. Some cars blow right through the stop sign at this intersection. When the school drop-off line bottlenecks, cars line 
Cascade Avenue, it becomes like a game of Frogger as cars try to navigate the intersection as children are walking in the crosswalks and other cars are making illegal turns in front of the intersection. The city needs to take action. We are in desperate need of a crossing guard to safely walk children across the intersection, as well as serve as a reminder to drivers that there are pedestrians. Thank you. Thank you very questions? much. Any questions? Oh, thank you very much. Next speaker is Barbara, Barbara Sponsler. Good evening, Chair Simpson, members of the commission, traffic commission. I'm Barbara Sponsler in Newberry Park. I too travel these streets. I too travel across from Sequoia and it is true that Manzanita is um, a little bit different kind of school than the other schools. However, I will tell you that donut shops profits have increased because of the students walking to school across that intersection to their school. Um, as you can see, I probably don't have children in the school. I just want to say to all of you, don't forget the needs of the children. As we get older, we still need to realize. I think that the crossing guards um, need to be there because I've seen many students stopping and talking to those guards because they've built confidence with those crossing guards. So it's one thing as far as security and safety. As you know, crime has increased, and yes, it has increased in Thousand Oaks and Newberry Park. So I would encourage you to keep those security guards. $280,000 is nothing compared to the cost of the bicycle lanes. And are the bicycle lanes more important than our children? Because if we lose one child, we've lost way more than $280,000. Thank you. Okay, hang on, um, Ms. Sponsler. But, uh, we have a question from uh, Commissioner Limo. Good evening, Ms. Sponsor. I have a question. On your card, you have checked in favor and opposed. I and know. I'm wondering if it has to do with the two different. Um, it doesn't really. Um, I thought you were t really trying to cut the whole program, which I'm opposed. But I'm, uh, as I listened to everything, I changed it because it sounds like to me that you're trying to work the different areas. And um, so it's not opposed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ready for comments? I'll Commissioner Lamel. <laughs> um, the first thing I, I want to do is just uh, sort of for the record correct something that Ms. Sponsler said because while I agree that security is very, very important with a lot of experience in that, that realm, I want to make certain that we never, ever make the mistake of thinking that a crossing guard is security. They're absolutely not. They're not trained, nor do they have the ability to, I think they may give confidence to students crossing, but once they leave that road area, there's literally nothing they can do other than dial 911, scream loud, or involve themselves into a, a situation. So I wanna make sure that we judge that from that position. Well, let me go through all my comments and then, okay, I, um, I, I believe, I'm, I'm not gonna comment on Greensboro and Windsor Drive because I'm just not familiar enough with the intersection. Uh, I've got, 30 years of watching the intersection at, at Borchard and Michael change over time. Um, I believe that the populace has uh, dramatically changed. The populace is older, and uh, very few, if any, as is shown by our numbers, students from Borchard are utilizing that intersection, and I do believe that um, the statistics that I've seen, because I'm in that business, is that we saw a dramatic change on September 11th, uh, 2001, and we saw that there was a dramatic increase in parents driving their kids to school. A perfect example of that is even up at Sequoia. People live within walking distance. They never have to cross the street to get there. The parents take their kids to school. It's a dramatic increase that we've seen. So that might be why the counts are so low 
because I, I believe with a magnet school, there has been an increase in, 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 in driving. Uh, enrollments in general are down. I don't know specifically if they're down also at, at Man's, Manzanita, but I'm trying to understand why they, our counts are so low. Um, again, with a lot of experience with uh, traffic counts, I can tell you cold weather does not affect, unless the schools have really gotten liberal, and once the temperature drops below 40 degrees, you don't have to go to school anymore, um, then we can't count that temperature. Um, I walked uphill both ways in 10 feet of snow barefoot, so I don't know why they would not go for cold weather. Um, and, uh, and, and I also think that what we need, what we need to be able to do is, uh, I think it is a valuable resource, but we need to provide it where it's most needed. And so I would hate for us to have to judge equally Cascada and Panamint or even Gainesboro, which I don't know the, 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 the facts there, versus someplace that, or, or for that matter, even Teresa. I think Teresa is really, really necessary. Um, I'd also like to uh, talk about my qualifications just a little bit because um, myself and the company I work with have probably hired 45 crossing guards um, just as a, a gratis to the community to make things safe during construction for kids that used intersections. So I, I know a lot more than I, uh, I ever wanted to about crossing guards. So for that reason, um, I'm, I'm going to support uh, staff's recommendation uh, as detailed in A and B of their staff report. Any other questions, comments, considerations? Commissioner? Yeah, I'd just like to make a statement that we rarely take a crossing guard away unless nobody's there. We really, you know, uh, look after the safety, and we do realize there are certain corners, even when the traffic sometimes doesn't meet the warrants. But in this case, I don't see that at these corners, especially, you know, ones that are protected by a signal and things. The, uh, correct me, but these don't become effective till the beginning of next school year, correct? Uh, that's true. It would uh, also have to be uh, approved by our city council, right. um, the removal of a crossing guard. Um, and so the recommendation from tonight will go, off, go on to our city council next month. Right. So um, in the time that I've been up here, which is 14 plus years, all we've done is, I believe, shuffle maybe three crossing guards and opened up at least that many more someplace else that was needed just due to demographics and where people live. So um, I would probably support this recommendation also. I want to acknowledge that we received some information right before the meeting uh, specific to Borchard and Michael and I wanted to get a little bit more information from the city staff regarding the type of outreach that was conducted in the community prior to uh, the meeting to make sure that everybody was informed okay we've been in communication with uh, both the schools where um, or the three schools that are affected by the uh, recommendation to discontinue crossing guard services uh, it, it, Prior to um, this meeting, we reached out to the principals to help them spread the word to the parents that would be affected, uh, whose, whose kids cross at these crossing locations. We had our crossing guards pass out meeting notifications to the students and parents who were observed crossing there. We started that last Friday. We also put up um, uh, meeting no notification signs of tonight's traffic commission meeting to um, uh, invite residents who or uh, uh, parents or students who uh, wanted to provide input to to the traffic commission that tonight was the uh, is their opportunity commissioner lamo yeah the one other thing that i would like to and i know the people here are all deeply involved so they know but i'm not so sure about the people at, at home I've lived here for 30 years and most of those years the responsibility for crossing guards was the school district it's when the school district got into financial issues that the city of Thousand Oaks, and rightfully so, 
um, took on paying attention to the safety of the children. Um, and so what I, what I think is, is admirable is instead of just taking that on and realizing that many intersections may have been wiped out by utilizing the state standard, we went more conservative. When I say we, the city of Thousand Oaks went more conservative with the state standard, but we still had to have some level of baseline. Otherwise, the expectation would be at every intersection there should be a crossing guard, which no doubt would make every intersection safer in the morning. But I, I just think it's important historically to know that this was not, this is a, a very generous benefit provided by our city, and um, we are much less conservative than the state is on how we achieve an intersection that has crossing guards. Any other questions to follow up with Commissioner Lameau? Uh, I have another question regarding uh, reevaluation. So should our commission uh, support staff recommendation? What are, what's the follow-up gonna be in future years when uh, neighborhoods change and enrollments could go up in certain communities? Are all these school sites reevaluated continuously on an annual basis or how could things potentially, if there is a trigger for more students that need to be serviced in specific areas, is the city reevaluating those those streets? Well, uh, we look at every crossing location, uh, new location on a case by case basis. For example, this the location of Cascade and Panamint, uh, that was something brought to our attention. So we performed a count. It met the requirements, so we're making the recommendations to install crossing guard there. If um, some of these locations were to have a crossing guard removed, or also in past years where we remove crossing guards, if we get a request next year to evaluate the location and it meets the re requirements for a crossing guard, we would uh, make a recommendation to assign a crossing guard at that location. Thank you. Any other comments here? Okay. With that being said, I'm very um, supportive of staff recommendation based on the fact that we have a long standing trust with our city to make adjustments as needed on an annual basis. And, and so I really appreciate that there was a concern and that our city was able to follow up and we're adding trust. A crossing guard support at a school where it makes sense and that you know we're using data to evaluate where that resource doesn't make as much sense however there's flexibility to adjust in the future so with that being said I'm very comfortable at this time to put a motion have somebody uh, put a motion on the floor uh, I'll move the staff's recommendation I'll second it Yes. Commissioner Reeder? Yes. Vice Chair Gregory? Yes. Chair Simpson? Yes. Motion carries 4 to 0. The Traffic Commission makes recommendations to the City Council and interested parties may attend the City Council meeting and speak either for or against the recommendation of the Traffic Commission. Any person wishing to appeal a decision of the Traffic Commission shall file a written appeal and pay an appeal fee with the City Clerk Department within 14 calendar days of this decision. The matter will be referred to the City Council at the earliest reasonable and available date. The appeal fee will be refunded only if the City Council overturns the Traffic Commission's decision. An appeal form is available from the Recording Secretary. Thank you. And now we can move on to item seven, status report of prior traffic commission recommendations. Okay, yes, this um, um, item is, has to do with our um, flashing yellow arrows, one of our favorite topics at the traffic commission. I uh, just wanted to give you the dates uh, last month that our flashing yellow arrows were activated at uh, seven new locations. Uh, we do have an eighth location, but that's not gonna happen until this fall. 
Uh, that one requires a little bit more work. Uh, it's going to be part of another uh, project that's going to provide additional improvements at the intersection at Girl Road and Village Glen. Okay, now moving on to item eight, commission referrals from April. Okay, um, item eight, uh, we summarize uh, three referrals that we received at our last meeting. Uh, first item has to do with the Arbalus at Westlake Boulevard, the traffic signal, uh, see if there's ways to uh, make the operation of that signal a little bit more efficient. We're taking a look at that. We'll bring that back to uh, the commission probably next month. Uh, we're also looking at Arbalus, the segment between Moore Park Road and the 23 freeway. Uh, some concern whether or not there's um, extra congestion going on there, whether or not travel times have increased uh, over the past um, uh, year or so or a couple years. Uh, so we're going to uh, do some evaluations, some travel time runs, uh, measure traffic uh, volumes there, and we'll bring that back to the Traffic Commission. And then um, item C has to do with a question on uh, the message, uh, changeable message boards or other signs located throughout the city. And um, that has to do with the projects that we brought to you tonight. Thank you. And now moving on to item nine, work program and commission schedule. Uh, any, uh, any comments about the schedule? Not about the schedule, but I do have some commission comments. Please. Yeah, we're, we're going to have, um, we are going to go back after we finish um, this section, we'll go back to item five, and then we'll, we'll have commissioner comments at the end prior to adjournment. So are we able to move, should we move back to item five now at this time? Okay. Are there, we are now on item five, backtracking a little bit. Uh, are there any comments on the summary notes? Okay. So at this point, we can move forward. Back to the final item on the agenda, which is commissioner comments and discussion. Commissioner Lameau. I've got a few comments. First of all, um, I had the pleasure of going through a DUI checkpoint uh, when they had it on, uh, gosh, I can't even remember the road now, but it was, it was on, it was on Borchard. And um, while uh, <laughs> that's not the reason I couldn't remember, <laughs> all of a sudden. Um, no, but what's, uh, what, I, what I thought was great is, while our police department has no real control over how long it takes to get to the front of the line, their staff was extremely courteous when you got there. And uh, so I, th I thought that was pretty nice. I uh, hadn't been drinking that night, so I just whizzed right through after that. Um, I, as a commissioner, you, you know, once your neighbors find out that you're on the commission, you get a lot of uh, concerns. Uh, in one that I've heard uh, probably more than I can keep count of, in fact, I don't keep count of it anymore, is the speed on Via Ricardo coming off the hill. Um, I'm not like most of my neighbors who can judge the exact speed and they're sure that it's 80 miles an hour. Um, but I can tell you this, I know it's not 25 or 30. That's all I know. And so, um, and other neighbors have suggested, why not, why not let the police stay in my driveway i'll fix some breakfast and everything so if we could uh i think the city could pick up some money and and also help out uh a lot if if we could get traffic control up there again um from what experience tells me on the commission probably about 95 percent of it are all our neighbors and friends that live in the neighborhood so uh, i think just having them there a little bit and a few people getting tickets the word will get out the other complaint is on some of the traffic lights when we see what looks like a camera on a traffic light, is that a camera or is that a car counter? The uh, camera overhead uh, strictly there for detecting vehicles. Uh, we don't, some of those have a capability of uh, counting cars, but we're 
strictly using those to detect uh, the presence of a vehicle or not to reg regulate the amount of green time the uh, poach would have. Okay, so this is the one time I'm going to agree with my neighbors because it's happened to me well in excess of a minute and a half to two minutes at uh, Ricardo, P. Ricardo, and Borchard. Um, there are no cars in any direction and no left turn, no green light where there are cars. Uh, also, I've been there, so I th I'm assuming this is a malfunction or it's a, a left turn light when there's no one on demand. But the regular lights are all four red. Now, I can't see the left turn, but it doesn't seem to me like the left turn would go off if there's no one queued there in traffic. Um, and I, and I, I, I say this because I think from a technology standpoint, we might want to take a look at other similar intersections that might have that same issue. And that's it. I think our staff's doing a great job. Mr. Finley? Yes, and, and we appreciate uh, our traveling public um, letting us know when they uh, get to an intersection that doesn't seem like it's working right. Um, we travel around an awful lot, but we don't get to every intersection all the time. And uh, so even though you might think you're, you're bothering us or something, we appreciate an email, a phone call. You travel those intersections every day. I, I travel intersections every day. I know the ones that don't seem to be working right really quick so please give us a call it is uh it is a camera they do uh not work sometimes correctly so don't hesitate to give us a call thank you any other questions or comments commissioner thank you uh along the same lines uh with our new flashing yellow arrows it's my understanding that if cars are queued to turn left that the green arrow will illuminate and then when they have passed through the intersection, the yellow light begins to flash. On the corner of Skyline and Hillcrest, uh, it goes immediately to a flashing yellow, even though there are cars queued up. On um, the lakes, it's just the opposite. They'll get a green arrow, and there's no car queued up there. And But eventually it goes to a flashing yellow, but it just delays the opposite traffic a little. So in light of that, too, just in this small area, uh, could staff check them all to make sure that they're functioning the way they should? Appreciate it. I'm, I'm not sure, but because I've been at that one as well, I'm not sure if that light triggers that way because it also allows you to make a U-turn to go to Mastro's. So in other words, both left turns come on the same. The left turn is really not just to get into Pep Boys, but if you make the U-turn to get to Mastro's. So that might be the reason why there's no cars and on, on one side and it triggers because they're not they don't have to be going to the lakes but they if they're in line to make the u-turn that could be it i'm not not sure but i will also say that in the whole time i've been on the commission i had the most positive comments about the flashing uh yellow arrows than almost anything else that's been a big deal Any any final words? I just wanted to thank Commissioner Reeder for making that suggestion and improving the city so much. Kudos. And at the last meeting, we did celebrate Commissioner Reeder with uh, some yellow sunflowers to symbolize each one of his lights that have been included in the city of Thousand Oaks. So it was a really fun celebration to recognize his achievement and um, innovation. Well, shouldn't we be taking a vote on whether or not those should now be referred to instead of the flashing left turns, which is not as explainable as the flashing reader signals? <laughs> or instead of making a left, we're making a reader? <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Oh there boy, we go. traffic humor at its best. I think they would fire us. <laughs> okay, so with that, I have no further comments. And we will go on ahead and wrap up the meeting here. So item number 11, this meeting is now adjourned. Uh, we will have our next Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission on at 6 p.m. on June 20th in the boardroom of the Civic Arts Plaza here on the third floor. Everybody have a great night. Thank